Sure. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Pursuing Results podcast, where successful people share one book that changed their life. We have a really special guest here with us today. This person was introduced to me by a mutual friend. He's local in San Diego. Sadly, I am not in the beautiful, great state of California today. I am back home visiting family. Greg is also on the road today. He's in South Carolina, hanging out with a friend and preparing for a speaking engagement on Monday at Real Estate Mm -hmm. Success Rocks. So we're both on the road, and we have an amazing guest with us to share a very interesting book and then he's also written a couple books so we'll talk about that how that all ties in most importantly the theme of the show is understanding how your number one who your ideal client is and how they make decisions and how that can improve your business and especially if you're uh, an entrepreneur speaker consultant coach I see this a lot in uh, in consulting and speaking businesses where there's not a defined there's an idea of who can hire them there's an idea of who their customers are but they do not specifically understand who their ideal client is or make a determined effort to go after a specific type of client and so I really want to delve into that so first of all Greg what's up what is up, Matt? I got to tell you, you know what? We were, we we're all of us are cutting it up off of line, uh, off of line, offline. You can tell that I'm slightly tired in South Kakalaki, or otherwise it's so, uh, South Carolina. It is hotter than you know what in where in the southern region of a male's body. And oh my God, it is unre- is unbelievable out here. But it's such a beautiful state, man. It is gorgeous. The food is amazing. The people are super cool. And you and I, I mean, obviously, I'm generally not wearing a Thor shirt and a, ba- and, a, and, a ba- and a baseball hat to do a podcast. But, you know, when you're on the road, you should actually see what I'm set up on right now. I'm set up on two of those high chairs for children stacked on top of each other sitting in a lobby <laughs> so we can get this thing done. So, you know, I the show must your dedication. Your endless dedication to professionalism never ceases to astound me you mean like this without no no shoes on as yeah. i do this yes That's yes right. in the hotel on. lobby mind you not your hotel room oh. the hotel lobby all right hotel lobby yes That's they call me blackfoot here <laughs> I, yes, well, I believe it yes <laughs> all right so let's bring in our special guest jeffrey bean jeff how's it going today good good i, I now feel overdressed because i'm wearing socks <laughs> 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 so that is a first for a guest. That's yeah. <laughs> we have had guests that don't wear pants, but yes, most of our guests do wear socks. So That's it's true. okay to feel overdressed. You can take them off at any time you want if you want to feel more part of the crew. I, ju- I took the logistics instructions very seriously. So here I am, and if the doorbell rings, I'll still be wearing everything. So <laughs> we appreciate And everybody, that. that is an inside joke. That yes, is an inside yes. joke. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so Jeff, you are an author. You are a consultant. You are also an assistant professor at, I believe it's so. It's UCSD, the extension, right? Do I have that correct? correct. Yeah. So, uh, so give people a little bit more deeper, um, just a sixty-second overview of kind of how you got into the field of customer experience design, which is a little bit where we'll go into today, and uh, like what led you into that, and especially what led to you being an assistant professor at UCSD. Well, you know, I I think. uh, Firstly, I was always curious about, you know, how people make the decisions they make and the choices they make. So uh, for many years, um, I really was motivated by, okay, you know, why do people buy what they buy? And so that's been going on. And then, um, you know, I'd worked for large and small companies, then done consulting. And then uh, back in uh, 2010, I uh, authored a, a book with uh, Sean Van Tyne. I should say we, we authored it and it came out in 20. Uh, 12, but basically what we started to notice was that a lot of the great companies um, solved a lot of the uh, questions that for themselves that I was asking uh, for my own clients and so forth. Um, and, and so what was interesting was, uh, you know, I found a group of companies that I nicknamed experience makers because they understood this thing called customer experience. And and, and then uh, as far as teaching goes, uh, I mean, it's been a pleasure teaching at UCSD and um, I had the opportunity to teach there uh, starting in, in 2013, and um, it was about almost a year after the first book came out, but there it's a combination of I love teaching and I love making a difference so that, you know, when my students come back to me or they email me and say, hey, because I took your class, I was able to do really well in that interview or I'm making these better decisions or I'm now helping to start an experience maker company. So. You know, it, it, it kind of comes full circle, you know, and you get to a certain point in your career where, well, gee whiz, you know, if I can't teach uh, something uh, that I've learned over the years or write about it, um, you know, what have I been doing all these years, you know? So uh, <laughs> that's kind of, 
you know, what goes on. So it's been, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And I, uh, I just, I feel very fortunate being able to teach at UCSD because they, they're, they're great people and, you know, they love great research and results. So. Yeah. And, and just, just because we got a chance to really meet and, and hang out in person, I know a little bit more about your backstory. So there's a couple things about that story that I wanted to touch on for people that don't know who you are and how they can apply that to their speaking consulting businesses, which is where you come from. So I just want to clarify, you're not an ac academic super yeah. sharp guy, but you come from the working world. You, you're yes. a consultant. Uh, you've worked with massive companies, small companies, uh, but that's that's kind of the, like you're working hands-on with the people that are in the trenches doing the work. You're not just kind of an our ivory tower author that came up with theories. And yeah. it's interesting how that opportunity kind of came across. So you, you set out to write the book very intentionally to yeah. build up a speaking and consulting business. It, it worked, number one. It gave you that credibility and it attracted that opportunity. But... Um, that that opportunity to to develop a, essentially your own course and which you'd never done before right uh, yeah i mean t tell me a little bit about that so people understand how that opportunity how you grasp that even though you had no idea how to really go about doing that well you know that's an interesting question um really you know as a as a business person i look at successful companies small and large and i started to look at them very carefully and say well how are these companies that are in multiple industries and some, again, some were very small companies, some were very large, well-known companies, but they seem to be better and different and more profitable than almost all other companies. Okay. And their customers were advocates. I mean, energized advocates. So yeah. back formally back in 2010, Sean Van Tyne, who's a user experience expert. And I, we were actually looking for an article to write, or a presentation subject that would be interesting because when you're a consultant, you write articles and, and, and you know, you make presentations because that helps get you the exposure and business and so forth. But this time, what we did was when we took a really careful look at and tried to find out what was common amongst a companies like, you know, whether it was an, at the time, the new Square or Apple or Starbucks or Netflix, um, what's, what do these companies have in common? And, um, you know, it took us a long time to figure that out. I mean, it was about nine months, which felt like a long time. In hindsight, it was a short time because we, we were very rigorous about how we were looking at it. But it turns out that they get customer experience. They understand consumer behavior and they totally get technology and not, oh, I'm going to develop technology and look for a market. It's I'm going to understand people at a very um, intimate way, not I'm, what I mean by personally intimate, but very insightful way so I can make better business decisions. And, and then, uh, and then a friend of ours who knew better, she had published many books and she said, you guys don't have an idea just for a presentation or just for an article. I think you've got, I think you've bumped into something much larger here. I think you've got an idea for, you know, something that could be a book. And that was the beginning of us, um, getting introduced to a literary agent and then spending time writing up uh, the business case or, or the, the book proposal that's a publisher grade book proposal. And, and then uh, between, I'd say between the end of 2010 and then doing all the interviews, uh, because to your point, Matt, um, we wanted to interview some of the best people at the best companies along with putting in our own knowledge. And then the book came out in 2012. That was the first book, The Customer Experience Revolution. So that's kind of how that path went. Because uh, it was so, a yeah. burning curiosity. I mean, yeah. You know. what, was, what, what did you find that was kind of revolutionary, you know, when, when it comes to the customer experience? What, what are people doing wrong versus what the major companies that are they're, they're, they're doing right? Are they, are they doing simple things like just asking their, their customers, like, hey, you know, what do you like? What do you like this? Would you like this upgrade? Would you like that, you know, lever here what, on the uh, X, Y, and Z widget? I mean, or are they just kind of moving forward on their own decision-making process? What, was there anything that jumped out at you that said, oh, my goodness, this is so simple but yet so profound? Yeah, well, first of all, um, it's that, yeah, they ask, but the kind of the continuum is, uh, and we learned this from talking to J.D. Power and Associates and then our aggregate view of all these companies. They ask, they watch, they listen, but then what they do is they anticipate and innovate. So there's a continuum. Ask, watch, listen, anticipate, and innovate. And what they anticipate is they're already plugged into what's changes in society and changes in 
uh, what people have as choices or alternatives to what they're going to offer, and then what technologies are coming along, whether it's the technology that they're developing uh, right now or other technologies. So they put all that together, and they totally understand that it isn't just a transaction that most people want. There's an economic piece. There's a time piece. You know, every kind of interaction you have, um, there's – uh, you and I asking, is this worth our time? And then there's what I call, and this is what we noticed across, there's the do fours. What is this going to do for me? And of course, the opposite is the do twos. There's really not a middle in there. What is this going to do to me? So when you have the economic and the emotional and um, the, the do fours, really driving people's evaluation of an interaction. So these companies actually want to make sure that every time you have an interaction with them, that all of those areas on each interaction are pleasing. And the really good ones will cause you to say, okay, I want to be an advocate for that company. Would Apple be a good example of that? Yeah. Apple's an experience maker. And, and I mean, it, arguably they're having their challenges now, but I mean, all these experience makers have, they've made good decisions and bad experiences, but they come back. Apple, yes. Amazon, Netflix, um, smaller ones uh, here, like in San Diego, um, we've got I Drive Safely, okay, or Skin It, uh, who make their small small company, uh, much larger uh, kind of in the last three or four years that make the custom skins for, um, you know, your, your phone or uh, they make custom skins for your uh, laptop or tablet. So, oh, yeah. You know. I have one of those actually on the back of my uh, laptop I'm shooting off of right now for our other oh. podcast, Real Estate Uncensored. So, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It might be a skin at one. Probably is. Probably is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And that's, uh, it's, I think the lesson there, especially that we as like individual, like solopreneurs, you know, I mean, even if we own some other business or whatever, a lot of, a lot of like, I mean, both me and Greg and a lot of the people that watch a podcast like this, we're, we're looking for content like this because we're looking to grow some sort of coaching, consulting, speaking, some type of like very solo type uh, business that runs off of our own intellectual property and kind of comes out of our own mind and our desire to help other people. And the, the mistake that I see a lot of times people making is they're doing the opposite of that process. The, that continuum of, of asking all the way to innovation, it, that continuum rests on asking yourself, what does the customer want? Like they understand who they want to serve. And then the only question is how do they want to be served now, which they may know, how do they yeah. want to be served in the future, which they may not know. Like a, the great quote by Henry Ford about buggy whips, mm -hmm. but it's all, it, all, it all starts with like, <laughs> it all starts with the other person. Right. And I see a lot of coaches and consultants. I talk with them and they start with themselves and their intellectual property and what they can deliver before they ever get to what does the client or the customer want. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and what could they want? And Greg, to, to, to your point, most of these companies know more about their customers than the customer might consciously know about themselves as far as behavior and emotion and economics, where a lot of businesses dismiss the whole idea of emotion. Okay. Yeah. And that yeah. is, uh, I, I, I disagree with that. Dismiss it at your own risk. Yeah, definitely. So, the, which I think that leads us kind of back into the, the main book that we wanted to talk about, which is Class, A Guide Through the American Status System. So, take me back a little bit to, uh, to where you were at and kind of when the book came into your life and why it had such a big impact on your thinking on, on, the, on this topic. Yeah, um, it was 1983 and I had finished uh, my book my uh, bachelor's degree in psychology and a minor in marketing. And what drove my interest in that was consumer behavior, not just consumer behavior, but business to business behavior and all that. Yeah. But this fellow named Paul Fussell came out with this book on what in general is a taboo subject in the United States in particular, which is to talk about that there's a class system because there's no formal class system, but there's classes and behavior. But his book, was a lot different than a lot of the sociology books uh, and a lot of the academic books. His book I found interesting because what it was was how can you understand people? Uh, how do they vacation? How do they recreate? How, what do they buy? What's the difference 
between people uh, who buy this car or that car? What's the difference between people who prefer hardwood floors uh, versus linoleum? And remember, this was back in the early 80s. So what was fascinating to me was this was not only a well-researched book from a very, very solid author, um, but it was really kind of right where I was at, which is I really would like to get to understand people at that level. Um, and in the early 80s, this was rather unheard of. Quite frankly, I think it took a lot of, uh, a lot of guts to put out a book like this, okay, at that time, because, it, you know, today it's, well, you know, where's the big data? I want to know as much about people, even at the individual level, as well as what's called the persona level, where you understand one person so thoroughly, and that person represents so, so many people like them, um, way past conventional se segmentation or customer profiling. But so Paul Fussell fascinated me with this book, and uh, so I read the book, and I was, uh, I was very fascinated to say, okay, I know it's well-researched in the real world. It's not an academic exercise. And for the next year or two, I went out and started observing a lot of the things that he observed and researched about certain people making certain choices, um, whether it was clothing or whether it was business decisions or recreation. Totally fascinating to me. Totally fascinating to me. You know, um, we actually had a big data company for quite a while. Um, well, we used big data for a company uh, that did predict predictive analytics. And the information you can buy about someone, and you start running different model systems, and you start seeing the patterns, like you saw the patterns and see the patterns, is fascinating. Like you were yeah. talking about it. Because then you start, it's like your eyes get open to a whole nother secret world. It's not, yeah. you know, Bob buys this, Mary buys this. No, there's an actual reason why they're buying the, or doing these different actions. So then you can go and predict the future, you know, what, what they're going to be doing down the road. And it is one of the most eye-opening experiences. And if, I mean, if people want to do it on a, a smaller lo level, and Jeffrey, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, seriously, go just sit at, in a public area and watch what heavy people are eating and drinking. Watch what thinner people are eating and drinking. And you'll start seeing a correlation between products, lifestyles, experiences, goals, dreams, Futures, how long you're going to be on the planet if you keep eating those, uh, you know, double big back, you know, might not be well, the same thing is hard on County Fair right and eat one of those <laughs> chocolate fried bacon things. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Matt's appetizer every time oh, when he and I go to dinner. To a Burger King near you. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the raw, it's going to be really interesting because um, – there, there's a new, I mean, even just in real estate, obviously, Greg, you pointed out the predictive analytics, kind of predicting who's about to sell their home. There's a whole, I, I talked to, uh, to Greg Harrelson, who's a past guest and, and friend of the show. We were talking the other day, there's something else that's coming down the pipe that's even more interesting in terms of using Facebook to predict who are the likely buyers and bring them in through Facebook ads and boosted posts into right into a back end like now big data is being merged with Facebook and behavioral analytics which then lead into lead scoring to give yeah. you a much better idea not only of hey who who do you need to call that's a likely lead but also oh here's all their social media profiles and here's the breakdown of what you need to know about them so that when you call you have a good idea of what their personality is going in I mean this is stuff that if you are inclined to make cold calls it's gold because you can literally adjust your approach before you even get on the phone and you can yeah. mentally prepare and adjust before you even even make the phone call rather than trying to adjust on the fly based on just their inner that short interaction with you I mean things are going to get very very different uh, very quickly but you, so you talked about kind of how that inform your your search you spent a couple of years just basically immersed in studying and, and confirming what the author wrote about but then what where was like what was the next step for you where did where did that lead you well for me I mean I started you know I had my first job out of school and at the basis of a lot of my decisions was always that combination of qualitative and quantitative information and then my own observation that it was true you know and so I was able to really help the computer company I worked for and they were kind of like well how did you do that and then I went on and I ended up working for a company uh, matter of fact in Atlanta a small uh, company a famous company years ago uh, that made modems and um, so we we actually fixed a couple things and made products specifically for people who well maybe they don't want the most advanced modem they just want something cheap fast and compatible and they want to buy it at 
the new thing at that time was computer superstores. And so, um, you know, I took engineers and marketing people and salespeople and took them out for lunch. And I said, let's go out and watch some customers. And, and then we won't interact with them, but let's watch some of the decisions they make because they're not buying the products that we're selling right now. But later on, about a year later, they were because we understood them better, you know, at a, at a very granular level. Um, and then eventually, you know, worked at uh, Sprint and uh, did something, you know, very similar to understand how to match distribution channels to, to uh, people's buying behaviors. That was B2B. Uh, and then um, targeting in general. I mean, that was, that was awesome. Yeah. And then, you know, it just, I mean, I don't know. To me, it's always fascinating. Now, today we have the challenge of you can't just use all the information of people's behavior on the internet. You have to understand them off the internet too, and emotionally, and, and that. But and AT and T, uh, um, you know, worked there first in data strategies. So when the data market was very hot, and we were building out a, a lot of data services, and went on to business development and um, some other strategic things. So yeah, it was it was really good. And by the time I got to San Diego about thirteen years ago, that's when I kind of started consulting and answering a lot of questions that my small high growth clients didn't know they needed to answer because I'd ask them questions about what they knew about their market and because everybody at the time you know when you're a consultant everybody says well I'm gonna help you take your company to the next level and I'm sitting there going well you know I mean that's like here we grow again you know so I, so what I was doing was I was saying let's define what that next level is and maybe we need to skip the next level well, what do you mean well maybe we need to skip the next level because there's certain there's certain growth is not healthy growth is not linear I mean it may cost you to grow to the next step more than you can afford so maybe the thing is is you need to grow much larger than that before you take on more people or you know it's again it's uh, it, yeah, that's it interesting. Complex, but Healthy growth is not necessarily linear growth. No, no. That is that that is that a very J. Abraham esque uh, uh, type oh, quote. I, looking, you know, looking for those uh, what would he call them? Like windfalls or um, it's it's not quantum leaps, but it, yeah, it's essentially the same concept of breakthrough. That you right. don't have to just go linearly to the next level. You can you can 10x or you can 5x your business just by thinking differently, and uh, you don't have to just slog through the next stage. Well, and, and to that point, there's certain stages where if you grow with your present costs, let's say if you grow a third or twice, you might not, you, you might be upside down in profitability. No. So maybe you're going to, I had a client here, uh, this was, um, I drive safely as a matter of fact, uh, and um, they're, I think they're still in Carlsbad, but uh, this was many years ago, and I remember their CEO, uh, fantastic guy, um, he said, we don't want to get caught in the, the bad part of the scissors, which was his cost. So, so the nonlinear part comes in where it's like, okay, we may have to grow twice as much as before we take on new resources, okay, as opposed to let's grow incrementally. Or if I have the expression, if you're a tactical expenser, if you look at everything as expense, we're going to grow incrementally and save up for market share. Um, I'm not thinking that's going to be true, particularly at the speed of some some markets, you know, the demand of some markets. Oh, yeah. So. I, I just, it, it's not only healthier to grow a, at certain rates, but it's also healthier to avoid uh, what what that client called the scissors, uh, where you don't want to be trapped in the, oh, okay, the growth looks good, but the cost is too much. Yeah, have to yeah, growth, like, yeah, like cost is growing up fa faster than your profits are. You have so to pretty much like Elon, and infrastructure and stuff like that. Or Elon Musk is what you're talking about. You mean just going all the way for it? You're not, you're, you're going bigger and then you're going to put your, put your money in as, as you grow, right? Right. And, and the other thing is, what I think is really cool is a lot of the experience maker companies, the, the great ones, totally get that, well, maybe I won't be profitable for six or eight years. This is the other way. Yeah. There's other ways to climb the mountain. But to your point, the, Elon Musk right now, he's looking to grow companies and grow solutions and the money will come later, a la yeah. Jeff Bezos. Okay. I mean, people were really upset. Stockholders were really upset many years ago when he forego, uh, you know, paying his stockholders and said, we're going to invest it in this thing called free shipping, which later turned into prime, which right. later re-architected the whole value proposition for buying online. So, and now stockholders understand, okay, that's why nobody's upset that Airbnb isn't profitable right now. I mean, nobody yeah. who knows how you 
capabilities to a certain point where it has a decisive advantage. And then eventually, you know, I'm not saying Twitter, Twitter doesn't have its challenges. You know, you can't be a startup for 10, 12, 13 years, but, but on purpose, you can forgo some profitability. And if it comes, reinvest that back into people, processes, products, and services and, and the experience people. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's definitely something that's missing in a lot of professional service firms is really that process of thinking deeply of who is my ideal client, who am I really going to focus on, which I think software companies have way, way better handle on this because they yeah. do a much better job. They're not dealing with real people uh, as much, right. and so they have to. They're forced to build like this client profile, uh, whereas professional service firms, we're dealing with people that have faces and names, and so we kind of skip that process. We skip that step. And, uh, and then we don't really think deeply about what, what, is the, what is the customer or the client in our case? What's the client's experience of us from their perspective? Because like, right. there's a big disconnect and you can see it's very easy to see in real estate because there's a lot of things to do behind the transaction. But the customer yeah. or the client is sitting over there going, I don't know what's going on. Or, you know, you try to bring them in and kind of fill them in on what's going on. Uh, and right. there's a lot of professional services that are delivered that way. A lot of the service is done in the, behind the back door. And then all, right. the, all the client interaction is done kind of in front of that. So they really don't know all the stuff that you're doing, which is where a lot of your expertise and value is done behind the scenes. And they have right. to know. So, like, we have to find, if we think deeply about what their experience is and we come at it from that perspective, almost like as if we were a software company, I think we would do a much better job of saying, I, I, yes, I need to keep some of those things behind the scenes. And yes. they don't need to be bothered with those mentally because that's my job is to take the mental thought out of that. But I, I need that's to right. do other things to make sure that they feel secure in the relationship and the value that I'm delivering is actually perceived. Because like, I mean, yeah. me and you, Greg, have said it several mm -hmm. times, like value that, like especially with real estate clients or prefer, like marketing agency clients, if value is not perceived, it isn't received. And yeah. you right. can be doing all kinds of stuff behind the scenes. If they don't perceive it, it's might as well not even exist. And so, yeah, I think there's, there's a huge lesson there for, uh, I mean, and, it's, and Jeffrey, you're in this business, you're in the consulting business, so you have clients of your own. I mean, how... Have you, done, have you gone through that process for yourself and taken those lessons into your, your business and think about who your ideal client is to where you know kind of how to deliver the service they want to deliver? Well, yeah, it, 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 I'm quick to identify. For me, um, I developed kind of a, a view of are they – people usually fall in on a scale of are they tactical expenses where they look at everything as an expense. And if I'm meeting with them – I can very quickly figure out if they look at if they're going to look at me as an expense no matter what it's that's a non customer that's it doesn't mm -hmm. matter on the other hand there's this is at the other end of the continuum strategic investors where their feet aren't necessarily on the ground but they're visionaries and they want to do things fortunately most of us fall in the middle of strategic uh, uh, investors and tactical expenses and so what I'm looking for are people who really respect the fact that you need to do um, great products and services, but also this extra thing called a great customer experience. Um, because sooner or later, you know, you're gonna, you'll either be compromised or hopefully you're the one, you're the experience maker going in there. But absolutely, um, you have to use that kind of by yourself and, and get your own insights to, to quickly make a decision. Oh, can, also somebody might say, well, gee, I'd love to work with you. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, well, I've seen this movie before and I'm not thinking this is such a good thing, you know, because <laughs> their expectations and my expectations won't align, particularly yeah. on upfront work. Okay. When you're talking about helping a client understand um, people to the point where you're very confident about the messages and the, uh, people, training the people, the, uh, the processes you should have, and the products and services you should offer. That's the whole kind of the customer experience continuum. It takes a lot of upfront work before you start seeing revenue. And a lot of people don't have that patience. So I'm actually, it actually comes out to probably only about 10 to 12% of uh, people that would be uh, a good match. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so you're basically, you're basing it on, 
you, you're, you have this kind of group of people that you know have a need, but then out of those people that have a need, you're looking for the 10 or 15% max of people that have the psychographic profile of leaning a little bit heavier towards the strategic investor with a longer time horizon, more risk tolerance, yes. that kind of thing. So you're looking for that in the behavior and the verbal clues from those initial meetings and trying to figure out their their personality and like a to build like build this psychographic profile essentially of them and yep. comparing it to your scorecard of based on who you've worked with in the past who have been great clients right right and I've got my eight to ten psychographic profiles or personas and uh, even last week a friend uh, inter introduced me to somebody and within five minutes I was able to figure out okay this person eventually is going to say I can't give you that's all nice and that's all useful, but I'm not going to be able to give you any money. <laughs> and I'm like, well, <laughs> I don't work for free. <laughs> you know, but, but the particular person was very um, impressed with themselves. And, uh, you know, they were certainly smart. But um, I, I basically said, well, you know, you're going to have to respect some of the upfront work that has to be done because, not because I say so, but because if you look at the best practices of the best companies, across most industries, which accounts only for 5% of all companies in the world. Uh, and that's according to J.D. Power. Uh, still, uh, you know, we interviewed him in 2012 and we stay up with, you know, the, uh, those stats. Uh, only 5% of the companies in the world really get this whole thing about doing all that upfront work like Apple does, like Starbucks does, um, Square and so forth. And, and, and so it, if you're taking that long-term view as opposed to, oh, no, I just want to get the cheapest help I can find, build something, sell it for a million dollars and retire on an, an island. And oh, by the way, folks, I want to do it in uh, less than two years. That's not who, that ain't, that ain't happening. Matter of fact, not even Steve Jobs was interested in stuff like that. Jobs, like Bezos, long term, they weren't, yeah. they weren't looking for the quick flip. And, and, and so even if somebody's saying, well, I want to grow my startup three to five years and then sell it to a larger corporation, like in finance, in the finance industry, after three to five years, you either sell, get big, or get gone, okay? And that isn't Jeff's rule. Uh, that's the rule of, you know, whether you're in banking or in, in, in insurance or, or, or whatever, no matter what part of finance you're in. And so if you know that those are the rules, you have to make plans for that and, yeah. and, and that. But you really have to understand uh, your, your client and um, – and so for me, yeah, I'm looking for that person who's that great longer term thinker who's the combination of strategic investor. They understand expenses because we have to be realistic and reasonably practical. But at the same time, um, kind of uh, as Greg said, you also have to have some of that strategic investor where it's like, well, I know it's going to be a little bit risky, but we got to go for it. They, I, yeah. I call it's that kind of Greg. I mean, that's. Yeah, stressful ahead. innovation. It's yeah, that's really a great successful term. companies. When you go into them, there's a, a positive uh, stress in there. Okay. Like yeah. I love Intuit. Intuit is only three miles away from where I live. And even though Intuit's certainly been around for a while, they're an experience maker, a great finance company, not just a software company. But when you talk to the, their, their people and you, you, you listen to them and you look at a lot of the products they develop, like SnapTax and stuff, you realize there's that positive innovation tension inside that company and they're and they're excited and passionate about what they're working on that's what you want and so i'm i look to i look to listen and f feel that from from different people because they can say all the other words they want if they don't have those certain things nailed down i'm wondering what's going to happen unless the whole model's changed and and i'm and i'm not aware but i try to keep my eye on things like that yeah yeah, and that, that applies to all of our businesses, just as consultants, speakers, trainers, coaches, all that good stuff. And Greg, I mean, even in your everyday life, as as in, you know, just in real estate working with people, I mean, you're looking for a lot of that same thing. You need someone with a risk tolerance, a long-term outlook, someone who's willing to invest a little short-term pain for the long-term gain. Yeah, without a doubt. Sorry, guys, I have you guys on mute. There's a lot of people coming in and out of here. Uh, but I, I agree 100%. I mean, it's like a, it's like Grand Central in here all of a sudden. It's like happy hour and everybody's like melting down over at the bar. Um, but I, I completely agree with you. I mean, having that intuitive sense, looking for the people that, you know, can take different stress levels. Uh, because, you know, when it comes to growing my team, 
I can't have someone that freaks out and they lose their marbles over one simple deal that goes sour. They have to be able to say, okay, take it on the chin and be like, okay, that's just, you know, the way life is. But like, like, like Be- Bezos, you know, Jobs, these guys, I mean, straight up visionaries, they see where they're going. And I just honestly wish to God more people actually viewed life and business in that same manner. Because imagine what we could do if we weren't instant gratification junkies. And right. We could actually go out and really look at this thing 10, 15, 25 years down the road and be like, oh my God, I could be X, Y, and Z in my business or my family or whatever else. If I was just willing to take the hit on the chin in the beginning, take a loss, like, like some of the companies you were talking about. Yeah, the upfront. No long term, you're going to blow up. And to your point, most of the, the real successes, pick any industry and, and look at the top successes, they're not thinking it's all about the, the quick transaction and moving on. That's not – but bear in mind, also 70% of the companies around the world believe that what we're talking about is not true, that customer experience and long-term thinking and doing the upfront work has not, won't even have an impact on their business. And what's funny is after I learned that, I had my eyes and ears open for companies like that, and then it was within two years that BlackBerry went away and Nokia bailed out of the smartphone market. I use that as an example because a lot of us, those are famous companies that we were probably customers of, and you ask yourself, how did that happen? That's how that happened is the the smartphone market in particular changed to customer and user experience instead of throwing technology or doing a transactive thing, and they didn't. Those companies' cultures uh, didn't change. I mean, it wasn't as simple as that, but that was one of the big ingredients. So yeah, it's, Hey, you know, if you want people to advocate for you, it's going to have to be more than just a, a quick transaction. Yeah, it is. Like Simon Sinek, who's one of my, you know, business heroes. I think the guy's, you know, amazing the way he views everything, but you know, his book starting with why I mean, people know what you put out there, but yeah. do they know why you're doing it? And a lot I of people, love, I, is he the one with the target yes, on the TED yes, talk? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Why is like a do for? Why am I doing this? What's this yes. going to do for them? Exactly. And, it, and it's, it's customer based, not commission based or cash based or anything else. It's, you know, back, back to that individual. Why do you actually make this widget project product or, or service? And once people start understanding that and they start changing the way they do it, um, it will revolutionize their industries. I mean, down to the point to, to a bum. I mean, Simon was uh, in New York City. He saw a lady that was sitting on the side of the street. And he said, hey, can, how much money do you make in a day? She said, 100 bucks. He said, can I change your sign from the traditional you know, thing? You know, every, hey, please give. God bless. I need money. I need booze. Whatever, right? And she's like, sure. So he changed the sign from, you know, please give, uh, God bless, blah, 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 to I know you don't give every day, but next time you do, please remember me. She made 100 bucks in one hour, picked up and went home. But it's about why to give. Like, I, hey, I recognize the fact you don't do this, but next time you do, please remember me. Same thing with Bezos, with Jobs, with, yep. you know, uh, any of these guys we're talking about. They understand that you're not going to purchase their product or do their service on a daily basis, but based upon the value or whatever you're giving to them, just keep them in mind. I mean, all right. of us have, have the little white headphones in right now, right? Well, right. Matt doesn't because he's on the road, but these all were Apple. These have a statement. They say, I bought something that's against the norm. Right, the right. Mac versus Apple commercials. We had an emotional connection to it. We, we right. wanted to go towards it, and based uh, everything based upon what you know Jobs was going for in the beginning. So yeah, I, it's 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 incredible to really start looking at this stuff. Well, and see, that's what's fascinating is in real estate, for instance. Well, it's kind of like years ago. I remember I was fascinated when a neighbor said to me he was a, he was an automotive engineer, but he worked a lot with the marketing people at Ford, and he worked for Ford. But he said, we have a new car out, and my marketing people told me I have to raise the price on a car that we're making to compete with, with uh, Lincoln and Cadillac. And I said, raise the price. And he said, yeah, because to your point, people's perceptions were that we weren't selling something valuable unless we charge them enough. And, mm-hmm. and then your, that, that sign example you gave, too, the lesson from that is, too, that change from transactional sign to contextual sign. Let me put this in context for you. Yes. And when you put things in context for people, suddenly things get a lot better, and, and, and it goes back to willingness to pay. Why are yep. people willing to pay? It's, even this morning on the news, um, I was listening, uh, I think, to 1070 uh, AM talking about people lining up for the new Apple iPhone and saying, well, why are they doing that? And I'm like, 
they understand the context and they're willing to pay and also their time. I'm willing to spend time waiting for this. And then after the transaction, they're advocating. And wouldn't you like to get have customers like that? Mm -hmm. Because Apple, for those people, not for everybody, but for those people, Apple puts it in context for them and the context it represents value. Yeah. So love yeah, that as a sign example. Yeah, that's that's a whole other level. It's there's there's a few there's a few like uh, really visible coach trainers or like independent people that uh, that create that kind of tribe mentality, almost a personality cult around themselves. Some of them unintentionally, some of them intentionally. But that that's like that's the ultimate level of uh, of leadership is being able to create those people that have a personality cult around you that they create because yeah. they get so much value out of the context you create for them by giving them an opportunity to make a statement about themselves by the fact that they follow you and identify with you. And that's when you become like this, this symbol, like a cultural symbol, yeah. you know, people that identify with Brendan Burchard or they identify with Tony Robbins. I'm a Tony Robbins guy or I'm a Mike Ferry guy. I'm a Tom Hopkins guy. It says all kinds of cultural and contextual things about you as a human being, about your yes. personality, about your lifestyle, about your daily habits. And it's a way of very quickly communicating to other people, either you're in, you're out, you know, either, either we're simpatico right. or we're not. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's like the ultimate level of getting to the individual, you know, for the individual coach or consultant or speaker or trainer, like that's the ultimate thing you can possibly shoot for. That's your brand. And, and by the way, what you just said is what excited me about Fussell's book in the first place was he was trying to understand that in the context of 1983. Yeah, yeah, with the products and services that were available then, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's uh so yeah, so let's give a plug for the book again. So this is uh the the book is Class: A Guide Through the American Status yep. System. It's Paul Fussell, F U S S E L L. It's on Amazon. Uh, as with all things on Amazon, you can get the used copy for exactly four pennies. Uh, so that <laughs> sounds like a no <laughs> sounds like a no brainer. How can you um, argue with then, that value? That's, <laughs> yes, the value, exactly. All right, and then there are two other books that we have to mention, which are Jeff's books. Uh, so The Customer Experience Revolution, that's the one Getting with right uh, Sean here. Van Tine that came out in 2012. And that's then right. the one that you have kind of uh, the, the cover, yeah, you've had that behind you for the whole time, The Customer right. Experience Rules, the illustrator for that. Do you want to share that real quick, who that is? Well, you know, I was really fortunate uh, enough to uh, work with, with uh, Steve and uh, Steve Hickner. And what I want to point out on this cover is Steve Hickner, if many of you have never heard of Steve Hickner, but you might have seen his work, if you've seen um, a lot of the movies that are animated um, by DreamWorks, okay, you have seen a lot of Steve Hickner's work. So I really, I was really excited to work with Steve. You know, the publisher said, hey, we want to do an illustrated business book and I was like okay you know who do you have in mind and they said well we haven't signed him yet but uh, it may be Steve Hickner uh, okay and I was like you're kidding and so uh, you've probably seen a lot of his movies already um, you know in in the theater so you'll recognize when you see his style of illustration you will know Steve's work that looks like right. a, a little bit of Monsters Inc right there that's it and um, and there's a couple of others here. I don't, let me, I'm, I'm looking for a larger one here. Oh yeah. And, and then, uh, that's where I was kind of stick. Well, actually let me make the cover a little closer, but you can see, uh, Steve's work is just incredible. And Steve's job as, as a writer, it was real interesting for me to work with because his job was to bring across the point of the best practice or the rule um, and then the other thing is to get across the emotion of the best practice. So what, you know, th this is about 52 best practices that the best experience companies, best customer experience companies uh, have uh, that, that are very effective for them. But Steve, with his illustrations, was able to say, okay, well, here's a reminder of what the rule is with a picture, but also here is uh, the emotion of that rule captured and why that rule is very important. Yeah, now see, Greg, it's great for you. Big, big picture. Yes, it is, Matt. And it conveys button, the meaning of the book. Colors. That's right. Big buttons. It's great, and, and they even like cartoons. This is this is a beautiful book. I can actually get through this. 
I think it's a good mix because you've got the customer experience revolution, which would be more of a linear book, which is a, re, a layout of the research and it's very methodical. And then you've got the, the rules, which is almost like it, I get the impression it's a book that you, you intended to be able to just dip into and turn to and get something out of it, even if you just picked up and randomly flipped to the middle of the book. And I think there's a place for both. Right, right. It, it's, the, the idea was uh, to make it a quick read or a selective read and then have the reader almost instantly benefit from the insight of 52, one or two, you could just go for one or two, oh, I'm going to concentrate on uh, making my customer experience more frictionless. Boom. Yeah. And uh, illustration, wow. words, quick. Yeah. Love it. My yeah, so there's a there, there's a lot a lot a lot of takeaways here. I mean, I, I I knew from just from us hanging out together in person and learning the the story of the background of the book, your experiences, what you did, the experience of like how you became you know this, so like a part time professor, all that stuff. It, there's so many lessons and so many takeaways for those of us that are building kind of any type of business where it's reliant on like we're trying to help other people get to their goals, whatever that looks like, whether it's, you know, speaking, training, consulting, coaching, whatever, or if you're just starting an entrepreneurial business that provides a service of any kind, there's a ton of takeaways here from your story. And hopefully people get a lot of things that they can go back and implement. If, if nothing else, just the idea of figuring out if you're a, if you're someone that provides a service and a lot of it is your time and your expertise and knowledge, just figuring out those, you said you have eight to 10, ideal kind of customer or client profiles, just That's knowing correct. who those people are and having kind of a scorecard and being able to narrow down within a few minutes of meeting a new potential client. Okay, where does this person fit? Do they fit in? And if not, why not? Is it something that's fixable or does that, is it a deal breaker? Because that would save all of us that are, that are actively in business providing some sort of service. It would save a lot of heartache and uh, unprofitable clients. <laughs> that's correct <laughs> so true. and we we don't like unprofitable clients no well you know and even even to the point where it can affect what you write on your website you know or yeah and should and as you know if you go to speak and you know certainly you know this you know the client would say well look you know i'm bringing you on as a speaker and my next question is okay who is the audience tell me about the audience and because yeah. and, and, again, I'm popping those personas and you can't please every persona. But if, if the audience is represented by, let's say, four or five personas, that's going to really impact my effectiveness, you know, for them by understanding them. So it isn't, you know, it, it's certainly not academic. You know, no, it, it, no, it really should permeate every like just the the way that you approach every aspect of your of your business. Yep. I love it. All right, Jeff. Well, hey, this has been a pleasure. We'll go ahead and, and put a nice little bow on this particular episode. So if anybody is uh, listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to hit subscribe. And then if you're watching the video replay of this one on iTunes or iTunes, YouTube, excuse me, that, that was a Greg type mistake right there, YouTunes. If you're listening on YouTunes, anyway, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit subscribe on the YouTube channel so you get all the future video episodes and all the good stuff that has to do with this. Uh, we would really appreciate it. It will help you out too and help you grow your own service or consulting coaching business. So um, for all of us, Jeff, thanks again. Greg, I will let you get back to enjoying the beautiful South Carolina weather, the blast Thank furnace you. that it is outside. Oh, God. <laughs> and everybody, so that's, uh, everybody that's watching the replay, we appreciate it. And we will see everybody next time. Hey, yeah, thanks for guys. having me on.